Let's start today's seminar. Uh, today's speaker is presenting here. from here. Uh, sorry, I cannot see from here. Yeah, yeah maybe. Talk about uh, RTX production uh, at the LHC. Uh, please start when you're ready. First of all, thanks to all the KIAF members for inviting me to give a talk over here. So, generally, I'm not a very loud speaker, so if you cannot hear me, then ask me, then I will be a little more louder. So, I am Prasenjit Sanyal, and I'm currently a postdoc in Kung Fu University. Uh, previously, I was a postdoc in APCTP. So the title of my talk is Include the 4B and the 4 msw by Electronic multi production as the smoking gun signals for the type 1 to So I will this is the outline of my talk. So first, I will give a brief overview of type 1 to interpret models and its polynophobic behavior. Based on that, I will talk about the importance of the electrophobic production of the BSM hitches over the QCD production. And then I will discuss the inclusive 4B final state, which is dominantly mediated by the electrophobic process. This will be useful to reconstruct the masses of all the BSM hitches in type 1 to LGM. After that, I will talk about the 4B plus W, where W goes to the electronic channels. So this final state can be achieved only through electronic process. And finally, I will talk about the chi-square variable, which is used to discriminate the signal from the background. Okay, so just like everyone says, so I'm also saying a similar thing that the standard model is the most successful model in explaining the fundamental particles of the universe and the interaction. So on the left hand side we have the the laser is not good. Last one. Right. Sound. This 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 one. Ah, this one. Ah, okay, this one. No. Okay, so on the left hand side we have the particle content of the standard model. So we have three gen three generations of leptons and three generations of quarks. The force carrier of the gauge goes on, and only one scalar particle, the Higgs boson. And on the right hand side, we have the timeline of particle discovery. So the blue part over here shows the time in which the particle was theoretically predicted, and the red part over here shows the time in which the particle was actually observed. So we can see that it took almost five years for the discovery of Higgs boson. So the discovery of Higgs is the tremendous success of standard model. But still, we know that standard model has theoretical and observational shortcomings. The ob observational shortcomings are primarily from the astrophysical observation. Also, there is no fundamental reason that we should have only one Higgs in the particle content. So if any other Higgs, like any charge Higgs or any neutral Higgs is discovered, then it will give a evidence of non-minimal framework of the electric chemistry. So the twist the model is one step extension of the standard model under the same gas symmetry. So this is the in the twist the model we have two S, two SU two Higgs doublet which are parameterized like this phi one and phi two where the v one and v two are the vacuum expectation values of the of the Higgs doublet which are connected to the electroweak wave in this way. The scalar potential of the twist doublet model with the softly broken V two symmetry takes this from. The V2 symmetry is used to avoid the heat mediated SCMC. However, we need to have a soft V2 breaking term like this. Now, based on the V2 symmetry in the fermion sector, we can have four possible UFAR types. But today, in this talk, I will be focused only in the type 1 to his developed model under which the fermions transform like this. So, all the fermions are coupled, coupled only to the second Higgs doublet and they get the masses from the second Higgs doublet too. So after the electrophobic symmetry breaking, the scalars and the Higgs sector consists of two CP even Higgses, this small h and big h. 
one CP or scalar A and a pair of charge Higgs. Uh, usually, conventionally, in the, in the standard hierarchy, we identify this small H as the observed 125 GeV Higgs boson. And in the standard hierarchy, we, the other CP even Higgs is considered to be heavier compared to this 125 GeV Higgs. So the independent parameters are the masses of the Higgs bosons, the V2 breaking term, this M12 square over here, the electric wave, the tangent beta, which is the ratio of the waves, V2 and V1, and sine beta minus alpha. This alpha is the mixing angle between these two CP even Higgses. Now, since we identify this small h as the observed 125 V Higgs boson, then its, its coupling should be similar to the standard model Higgs. So that, that's, that makes the requirement of the alignment limit, this sine beta minus alpha close to the one. So that this couplings of the small h to the fermions and the gauge bosons are exactly like the standard model. Okay, so after the electroweak symmetry breaking, the Euco Lagrangian takes this form in type 1 to SDM, where the, the, the factors like xi are the Euco coupling modifier, which is given in this table for type 1 tweak doublet model. So now if we see for the for the zero scalar and the, for the charges, the Euco coupling modifier takes this form. I mean it is proportional to 1 by 10 beta. So for large tangent beta, all the couplings of charge G and, and pseudo scalar to the fermions is suppressed. So in that sense, they are fermiophobic. And if we see the u car coupling modifier for the heavy Higgs, the non-standard uh, CP even Higgs, which is heavier than 125 GV, this coupling is also fermiophobic for large tangent beta and for the alignment limit. So we can see from this expression. The gauge coupling to the uh, to the Higgs boson is given over here. This these couplings are independent of the types of tweak double model. So the all the red ones are like enhanced by the alignment limit, and the blue ones are suppressed because of the alignment. So let's see the current limits on the type one to HDM. So the limits are the theoretical constraints like the vacuum stability, which requires the scalar potential to be bounded from below, the constraints from electroweak precision observables, the flavor physics constraints, primarily the B2S gamma constraint, and the collider physics constraint like the direct searches of the Higgs bosons and the and the Higgs, I mean Higgs signal measurement. So they, these are the primary constraints on the model parameter. So on the left-hand side, we have the constraints coming from the T parameter. So we can see that the, the, the T parameter constraint uh, restricts the mass splitting between charge Higgs and the other BSM Higgs, like heavy Higgs and the zero scalar. So the charge Higgs has to be degenerate with either of them. So this figure is taken from this, this paper. So in, in their notation, this H BSM is nothing but the capital H or the big H in my notation. Also in the right hand side, uh, we have the limits on the coupling of the heavy Higgs to the gauge boson and to tan tangent beta. So we can see, so in my notation, this will be cos of beta minus alpha. So as we can see that the cosine of beta minus alpha is restricted within 0 0.3. So this is nothing but the alignment limit. And also the color bar over here shows the coupling modifier of the of the heavy Higgs. So as we can, as we have say as I told before, for large tangent beta and close to the alignment limit, the, the coupling almost vanishes. And along this dotted line, the coupling is absolutely zero, fully fermiophobic at, at this dotted line. Okay, so in the lower panel, we have the, I have the plot from my paper, which I did with Tanman. He was previously a postdoc over here. So in this case, I considered that charge Higgs is degenerate with the zero scalar. And I have put the limits from the direct searches of the additional Higgses. 
So the red points are the points which are parameter space, which is ruled out by the direct searches. And the blue points are the exclusion limits coming from the B2S gamma constraint. So we can see because of the fermiophobic nature, uh, the exclusion is limited only to low tangent beta because at high tangent beta, the, the exclusions become irrelevant. I mean, there's no exclusion because the it's because of the fermiophobic nature. Okay, so to prove the, the all the additional Higgses uh, and to understand the dynamic behind the electroweak symmetry building, we need to study the multi Higgs production. Usually, I mean, the multi Higgs production is studied through the through the QCD processes like the gluon fusion or DB bar induced processes. But as I as in the scenario of the fermiophobic Higgses, these cross sections are usually suppressed. So in that sense, we have to go to the electroweak processes. So the, this this is the neutral neutral pair production by electroweak process. This is the charge pair production by the electroweak process, and this is the charge two body final state, which is. And this charge to body final state can only be pro produced by electroweak process, as this involves the Q Q prime balance core. So this cannot be produced. This final state, two body final state, cannot be produced through QCD process. Now this Higgs boson or this charge Higgs can decay further to neutral scalars or with scalar in association with gauge bosons to body, to produce three body final state. So for the next few slides, I will be talking about the results given in this paper. So they have considered the type one to HWL model and they have considered the mass range of heavy Higgs within this one, charge Higgs within this range and the zero scalar in this range. Also, let's first talk about the two BFS and three BFS charge for state. So these are the cross sections of given in this paper. This uh, cross section for the two body final state, charge two body final state. They have plotted the cross section with, with the cumulative mass of the Higgses. So we can see the cross section is good enough. And over here, they have provided the three body final state for the, for the charge two body final state as a function of the, uh, the cumulative masses of the scalar field. So we can see that the cross section can go beyond 100 femtogram. So the electroweak process is quite strong now in type 1 to interweak model. So and this three body final state cannot be achieved through QCG process. So in that sense, the electroweak process is more complete. Next, let's go to the neutral two body final state and the neutral three body final state. The, the in the upper panel. We have the, I mean, in the two body final states can be produced by the electroweak processes as well as the QCD processes. So the, in the upper panel, we have the cross sections uh, for the, for the electroweak process and in the, in the vertical axis and in the horizontal axis, we have the QCD production cross section. So we can see that in, in all these figures, the electroweak cross section is more dominant compared to the QCD cross section. You know, many of the points are to the left of this line. Along this line, the cross sections of the QCD and electroweak are same. But for the lower panel, we can still see that the QCD cross section is dominant compared to the electroweak cross section. Okay, so next we have the three body final state, the, new, the neutral three body final state. So once again, we can see that the cross sections for the electroweak processes can be significantly stronger than the QCD processes. Is there any question by him? Uh, oh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I just have a question please for the, for the previous okay. figure. Uh, for the total cross section, um, maybe the Is previous- no, I think the previous slide. So, uh, uh, no, 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 yes, yeah, this one. Uh, 
Yes, yes, this exactly one. this one. Yes, yes. So in principle, the production from the BB board depends on the temperature, right? Or, yes. So do you know any estimate of the uh, Tempita ranges that is assumed here, or this is a fixed Tempita? I mean, they have... In the previous, no, previous. Pre I here. mean, they have... Uh, to, to 25. Ah, yes, okay. They have okay. scanned over this range, 0 to mm -hmm. 255. And for mm -hmm. large tangent beta, the cross-section by the QCD process is going down. I see. And large tangent beta will be allowed by the experiment, uh, experimental constraint. I see. I see. I see. But the well, electrobic process, mm -hmm. there is no such constraint. I see. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you. Okay, so, so these are the neutral three body cross section. So we can see that the cross sections through the electrobic process are still being significantly, for some par parameter points, are significantly higher than the QCD cross section. So let me talk about some, some trilinear couplings for the HIP. So since for the next few slides, I will be talking about the light pseudo scalar. I mean, the, in that case, we need to discuss about the three trilinear couplings. One is this one, the Higgs, I mean, standard model Higgs to zero scalar coupling. So even at the alignment limit, the coupling is not zero. So when the pseudo scalar is lighter than uh, uh, lighter than half of the standard model Higgs, then there will be a strong constraint from the Higgs invisible decay. And for the Heavy Higgs to light Higgs coupling that is given like this, which vanishes at the alignment limit. And the heavy Higgs coupling to the pseudo scalar is given like this. And in the alignment limit, it takes this form. So for the case of light pseudo scalar, the heavy Higgs will either decay into a pair of pseudo scalar or into a pseudo scalar and a gauge boson. Because the heavy Higgs is fermiophobic, it cannot decay dominantly into the fermions. Okay. So recently I studied, I did a work with uh, Stefano Moretti, Shweb Munit, Tanmay, and yes. <laughs> so I studied the inclusive 4B final state, which is mediated dominantly via the electrical process. So the contributions can be divided into two parts. One is the charged contribution, charged final state contribution, and one is the neutral final state contribution. So if we see the, the first three processes, the dominant contribution will come from the AAW mode. But if, you, if we see the neutral con contribution, from the, the contribution from the neutral state, the contributions and the dominant contributions can come either from the AAA mode or from the AAZ mode, depending on the branching ratio of heavy Higgs to the pseudo scalar. I mean, in cases, if the branching ratio of heavy Higgs to pseudo scalar is dominant, then this AAA will be the dominant mode. Okay, so let's talk about the, the dynamics of the, of, I mean, the topology of the signal. So the, for the AAW mode, one pseudoscalar is the prompt pseudoscalar and another pseudoscalar is coming from the decay of charging. So this pseudoscalar is non-prompt. And these two pseudoscalars can decay into, into BV bar. So we have the 4B final state. And the W boson can decay inclusively. So this X is coming from the W boson. This, uh, the majority content is the jets from the W boson. And for the AAA mode, we have the pseudoscalar production in association with this heavy Higgs. So this pseudoscalar is a prompt pseudoscalar. And the pseudoscalars coming from the decay of heavy Higgs are, are the non-prompt pseudoscalar. So we can have at least 4B from here, and uh, if we consider one of the pseudo scalars to be decaying in, 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 inclusively, so we have at least four B over here. So we have chosen two benchmark points for the pseudo scalar. One is seventy GeV, and another one is fifty GeV. So this one is heavier than the half of standard model Higgs. So the B jets coming from from this pseudo scalar are supposed to be, I mean. And the efficiency will be larger compared to the BJs coming from here because for this case the BJs are softer. And also for the benchmark point one, 
the branching ratio of heavy Higgs to pseudoscalar is dominant compared to branching ratio of heavy Higgs to pseudoscalar and Z boson. But for the case of, for the second benchmark point, the branching ratios are like, almost like comparable, 50-50. So in the first benchmark point, the dominant contribution from the neutral, neutral state will be the triple A mode, which I will show later will be very useful to reconstruct the mass of the heavy Higgs. But for the series, for the case of 50 GV, the AAZ mode is also substantial. This we can see from the cross sections over here. So uh, as I told before, the AAW mode is always the dominant mode for the charge final state. But for the case of the neutral state, the AAA mode is dominant when this one is low. But for the case of <coughs> in the case of second benchmark point, this AZ mode is also substantial and reducing the AAA cross section. Okay, so the inclusive 4B mode has the very strong background coming from the QCD multijet. It is a almost 10 to the power seven picobar. And the TT bar jet background is also there. So, anyway, so this 4B, inclusive 4B final state, when mediated strongly by the electrobit process, can be useful to reconstruct all the masses, starting from the pseudosphere, which is the daughter particle, to the parent particle, like a charge heat and a heavy heat. So, in the next few slides, I will talk about how we do the reconstruction of this. Higgs bosons using the inclusive 4B state. Yeah, so, so, can you go back to previous one? Yeah, so in X, you have uh, jets, right? Yes. So, X can be anything, jets, yeah. including B jets. Yeah, but you said that uh, from uh, P parameter. There is a tight constant between the splitting, right? Splitting, splitting. Of, let's say charge Higgs and neutral Higgs. Yeah, it has to be degenerate with either of them. So it's not degenerate with, I mean, charge Higgs is not degenerate with the zero scalar, but it is degenerate with the heavy Higgs. You mean H? H, capital H, big H. Okay, so the, this splitting can be large. Yeah, this splitting can be large. But as far as I remember, the P parameter actually depends uh, on both, right? On H also and A also. Mm -hmm. If you see the uh, analytical form of T parameter, mm -hmm. it should depend both on uh, capital H and capital A, right? So in that sense, uh, the T parameter uh, should depend uh, both uh, with uh, splitting of H plus. H and H plus A, right? Now, if, if you make identity, I mean, charge H and pseudoscalar or charge H or heavy H is identical in terms of mass, then you can satisfy the T parameter function. Of course, when they are all degenerate, then also you can satisfy. So you, you are saying you don't need to put uh, no, no, no. on this? No. Okay, let me continue. Let me continue. Okay, so now let's first talk about the daughter particle reconstruction. The daughter Higgs is the zero scale. So since in our signal we have at least two two zero scalar, so we expect to have. A uh, excuse me. So for this one, what what production channels did you consider? I considered all. You included all, all the electrobit. All the electrobit. Yeah. Okay. So the 4B, inclusive 4B, is dominantly mediated by the electrolyte processes, and these are the six contributors. Uh, so you consider kind of inclusive, inclusive, inclusive contribution by, by electrolyte process. Okay, okay. So you consider the two benchmark points, mm -hmm. and you calculated the, the each contribution from yes. six channels, right? Yes. Okay. Then, in the next slide. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going for the, I mean, if we have electrobit con dominant contribution is electrobit process mm -hmm. for the inclusive 4B state, then we can 
deconstruct all the DSM Higgs, starting from the daughter Higgs, which is a kiloscalar in our case, to the parent Higgs, which is charged Higgs and heavy Higgs. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal of our work. Mm -hmm. So first we reconstruct the kiloscalar. Since we have at least two kiloscalars for in every process, so we have in the, we have at least four BJ. And we assign, I mean, the momentum and the transverse momentum should be at least 20 GV within this range of eta less than 5. So out of the three, out of the four leading BJ, we can make three possible combinations, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 4, 2, 3. So these numberings, like 1, 2, 3, and 4, these are the, I mean, these are the BJs ordered in terms of PT. So we can make three combinations out of the four BJ. These are the three possible combinations. Now, see if the BJs are, I mean, if the BJs are coming from the same zero scalar, so they should be close to each other compared to the BJs which are uncorrelated. So that's why we use this pair, in, I mean, pairing of algorithm. I mean, we have to minimize this, this quantity where delta and delta R1 and delta R2 for a given combination is given like this. So when this is minimum, that means the BJs are close to each other. But also we put an offset of 0 0.8 to, to avoid the pairings in which case the BJs are overlapping to each other beyond 0 0.8. So this is how we identify the two BJ pair and then we put an asymmetric cut on the BJ pair. I mean, where M1 and M2 are the invariant masses of the BJ pair. And asymmetric cut suggests that alpha should be less than 0 0.2. So the asymmetric cut makes sure that the BJ pairs are coming from two identical sources. So the identical sources are the two zero scalars in our case. So over here we have the, the distribution for the signal for, for the two BJ pairs, and this is for benchmark one and this is for benchmark two. The green uh, distribution is contains the, the leading, the, the BJ pair which has the leading BJ, and the blue one is the, is the other BJ pair. And similarly for the background, the red, red one is the BJ pair which contains the leading BJ, the black one is the BJ pair which it doesn't contain the leading digit. So this signal, this signal has the signals have the contribution of all the electrolytic processes. And similarly for the background, I include the multi-jet background along with the TT bar jet background. So we can see that for the signal, the for the benchmark point one and benchmark point two, they are the peaks are exactly at the right position. It is exactly at 70 GV and it is exactly at 50 GV. Okay, so let's now now once we know once we reconstruct the zero scalar, our idea is now to reconstruct the charge heat and the heavy heat. So the charge heat is reconstructed based on the yeah. A. Is there a specific reason for uh, taking zero scalar to the lightest one, or each and the real one also can be lighter than zero scalar and keep the same minus uh, like the heavy. Every uh, lighter the than real part of the dumbbell. Yeah. Let's suppose that's lighter than the single scalar. Is it possible to mimic the same as well? Uh, I mean, my question is why you choose single scalar to be lighter than the real one? Yeah, compared to the heavy Higgs. Yeah. You can make the alternate thing. I mean, heavy Higgs is lighter and the yeah. scalar is. So then it will mimic the same signal. Or why I mean, the, not, right? Because the decay chain will be different. Decay chain will be. If we go to the decay chain. Uh, no, in that case, the heavy heat will be dominantly decaying to four diphoton. Maybe. Would, would you say again? Heavy heat will become like the Fermi of a big, I mean, the light heat. 
I mean, this is this he is asking in the. Uh, can I just write? Oh, so your question is like if instead of the pseudo scalar, if you have the heavy into what they do. <coughs> Why not heavy? Like if you choose that is lighter than A. So he's, like, ah, he's questioning about the higher. Than the I mean, you are asking say that the A is heavier than H. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, A can decay to HZ. But if you switch the masses, then you can forbid that decay. Of course, we can forbid that, decay. but in that case, uh, we have to see whether we can dominantly get 4B or not. We have to see that. The process can become different. Yeah, that was my question. Okay, so in our case, our, the pseudo scalar is the lightest of the all the Higgs. And since even though it is fermiophobic, we, I mean, it's bound to decay into the BB bar channel because the couplings of the couplings are all identical to the fermion. Even if even if it is fermiophobic, but because it's light, it is bound to decay into the BB bar model. Okay, so what we have I have explained the pseudoscalar deconstruction, the daughter Higgs deconstruction. Now I will go to the parent Higgs deconstruction. So first, I will talk about the charge Higgs reconstruction. So this charge Higgs reconstruction is primarily based on the AAW topology. So if we see the Feynman diagram for the AAW mode only, so this, this A1 is the prompt pseudoscalar, which is produced in association with this charging. So this A1 and this charges are supposed to be highly separated from each other. And since this A1 is the prompt pseudoscalar, I can assume that the transverse momentum of this pseudoscalar is heavier from the non prompt pseudoscalar. The non prompt pseudoscalar comes from the decay of charging. So this W boson can decay further into the quarks to produce two, two jets. So the two jets are actually the part of the X, which, is the, which I, X is, means the inclusive. So I select two jets and at least four jets to uh, to identify this topology. So these two jets should satisfy the invariant mass Nw plus minus 25 GV. And we make all possible combinations. We make all possible combinations of two BJ pairs and the correct combination of BJ pairs should have invariant mass within 45 GV window around the pseudoscalar, and they, the, and they should also satisfy the asymmetry cut. So once we obtain the two BJ pairs, then we have to identify which of the BJ pair is coming from the prompt pseudoscalar and which one is coming from the non prompt pseudoscalar. But that depends on the assumption that you know the mass of a pseudoscalar yes. before. Yes, that's why I first reconstructed the pseudoscalar. So once I know the mass of the, uh, mass of the pseudoscalar, then I can use that mass information further over here to reconstruct the parent Higgs. But in the previous slide, you showed me this distribution, but but oh, 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 what, what is accuracy? Because I think the significance. The, yeah. The significance of the cluster. I, I don't know. I, yeah, that I will come later. after all the okay, okay. reconstruction. Okay. Let, let me first in, uh, say all the algorithms first. So, okay, so once we find the BJ pair, we have to identify which BJ pair is coming from the uh, from the prompt pseudoscalar and which one is coming from the non prompt pseudoscalar. So as I told before, so since A1 is the prompt pseudoscalar, 
the transverse momentum of this zero scalar will be higher than the transverse momentum of the non prompt zero scalar. So we will use this criteria and check within these two pairs in BJ pairs. So suppose BI and BJ is coming from A1 and this BK and BL is coming from A2, then they should satisfy this criteria. So I always check this criteria within the pair and then decide which is coming from the uh, prompt zero scalar and which pair is coming from the non prompt zero scalar. So this BK and BL, once I have identified that BK and BL is coming from A2, this BK, BL and the jets from the W boson make a four jet system, which whose invariant mass will reconstruct the mass of the charging. Now it might happen that more than one combination is satisfying this criteria. Suppose, I mean, this BK, uh, BK and BL and BI and B, BJ should have invariant mass within this 45 GeV window of the pseudo scalar. But it might happen in some cases that this BK and BJ also satisfying this criteria. Then we have to find out that which is the correct combination. So the idea is that <coughs> the, the reconstructed charge heat and the prompt pseudo scalar should have maximum separation. <coughs> that criteria is used to find the correct combination out of, out of if, we have, if we have more than one combination. So this is the this is the normalized distribution for the signal applying this algorithm. So uh, the red one is for the signal and the black one is for the background. The signal consists of all the all the electric processes. But since the I mean the algorithm is based main, mainly on the AAW mode, the contribution to the signal will be dominantly from the AAW mode. So that's why we have peak exactly at the charging mass. And also for the background, we include the multi-jet and the TT bar jet background. So any question? Uh, oh yeah, I just have a question now, please. So uh, yes, here in this plot, yes. So here you consider the background, but previously you just said that the, the background is somehow the simulated uh, multi-jets that uh, from QCD, which is around uh, 6 million picobar, right? the cross-section for this uh, kind of background somewhere. So oh, yes. Yes. So in principle, uh, to obtain or to simulate uh, this kind of uh, events or background, and the, when you reweight according to the, the generated events to, uh, to this cross-section, then for sure you lose the statistics unless you yes. in, you just generate, uh, I don't know. I mean, it takes yeah, a very, I, I, very I long. Yeah, I have generated like 100 million multi-jet background. So it was really a painful task for me to generate 100 million and work with that kind of, even though that's why I didn't put any strong, strong cuts uh, over here. So usually this cut has been, this selection criteria has been borrowed from the CMS paper and mm -hmm. they really put a very strong cut of 0 0.1 instead of 0 0.2. So I have relaxed the cut just to get enough statistics from the background. So, in fact, if we reduce, I mean, if we make this cut stronger, then the reconstruction will be much better. Mm -hmm. I see. So, uh, even with the 100 million event that you've generated, um, um, the, do you think the statistics are okay? Or, I mean, do you know you have enough, like, for example, you, you have, you should have weighed the contribution from the two backgrounds according to their background. So I think dominantly the multi-jet uh, QCD of course, of process. Course, yeah. So to, it's, it should be very, very sensitive, uh, your analysis to this specific background. So, I mean, and if you lose any statistics uh, by, I mean, by chance, then you may have some um, dangerous, basically dangerous in your analysis. So do you think that with this, even with the 100 million event that you've generated, you have enough statistics to make a conclusion at the end or? I mean, for, uh, for the pseudo-scalar reconstruction, I have enough statistics. Mm -hmm. Because over here, I just need 
four digits and I do not put any other cuts. This is just uh, how to make the, how to choose the correct combinations to make the digit pair. So there's no, no such cuts except this one. Mm -hmm. So for the pseudoscalar reconstruction, yes, I have enough statistics, but the problem is that when we go for the Chalcic reconstruction, this criteria will reduce the, the background statistics by a, by a large amount. This is true. So for, uh, but still for, for, I mean, 100 million background, we still have sufficient statistics to get some estimates, some results. Okay, so maybe I ask a question. Maybe you have the answer in the next slide, but I'm curious to ask you this as a question now. So when you do, when you calculate your significance, uh, like signal significance at the end, uh, have you considered the statistical uncertainty that you may face here when you calculate the this? Of course, the QCD background has got large uncertainties. We should we should take this into account, but. Uh, so far, for the estimation of the significance, I still didn't, con con I mean, uh, consider the background uncertainty. Just S mm. by square root of B, where B is the number of events. Mm, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. What well, What is the ratio between the number of signal and the number of backgrounds? I mean, what in that histogram? I mean, I mean that those. Those are normalized. These are normalized. So, so, what is the you know the usual? I mean, ratio? if you if you scale it to the luminosity of like three thousand something. Yeah. Yeah. That that uh, I that uh, that plot I don't have right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but that will be useful for the for to get the significance to get the to get some estimate about the significance. Yeah, but the estimation of the significance like S over square root B, yeah, we know exactly. there is no there is no inclusion for the uncertainty in 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 this uh, like estimated uh, estimated expression, right? Yeah. So mm. the thing is that that's why to get enough statistics for the background, I have kept the the selection cuts as minimal as possible. So in principle. For example, in the heavy, uh, light, I mean, for the pseudoscalar reconstruction, I have used this, this pairing algorithm based on the closeness of the jets. But when we move on to the charges reconstruction, I have paired based on that the bjets should set bjet in a pair should satisfy the invariant mass of pseudoscalar. So in principle, I should apply this one along with this one to get better reconstruction. But since we, are, we have less statistics for the, uh, for the background, so we are, we are making all sorts of relaxations in the selection criteria so that we do not lose any statistics for, for background. Okay, but, but this kind of uh, uh, relaxing the selection criteria I assume that you can you can collect uh, more uh, like mismatching or misclassified or some events that at the end uh, affect also the uh, overall significance, right? Now, what are you saying? Like uh, relaxing the uh, the selection conditions that you have at the moment. Mm -hmm. So this is this is allow for more uh mis uh, misidentified basically particle that you want to, to bear so maybe you miss the signal reconstruction carefully right and this is at the end the yes. effect affected overall significance right yes that's true that's true the mm -hmm. more more stronger you put selection cards the better will be the reconstruction and better will be the significance of of the mass reconstruction Mm -hmm. So since we are but but, but you have not so uh, do you have any uh, like uh, quantified like amount how how this uh, relaxation might affect the overall significance that you have or you do yeah, I, I mean you want to see the significance of the uh, no 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 I mean um, once you release the cuts I mean if you release the cut and if you do not release the cuts I mean how much you lose. Uh, if, the, if, we, if we do not relax the cards, then we, we will just run out of stat statistics in the case of multi-jet background. 
Ah, I see. I see. In that case, hundred million background is not sufficient. If we I impose see. a stronger card, then maybe we need like thousand million uh, background for the multi jet. So this this is beyond our scope. Ah, okay. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I see. I see. It, so our approach is very conservative in that way. Very oh, yeah. Uh, okay. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So. So the charge disk reconstruction is done based on the AAW topology. So now we have to reconstruct the other Higgs, the heavy Higgs. So this is done based on the AAA topology. So it, if you look at the Feynman diagram for the AAA, so we have this pseudoscalar A1, which is produced in association with this heavy Higgs. And this, this A1 and heavy Higgs should, be, uh, should have large angular separation. And this A2 and A3 are the prong pseudoscalar coming from the decay of this heavy Higgs. The pseudoscalars A1, A2, and A3 are supposed to decay and give, give us Higgs bridges. So we are so in the X we are taking two from X we are taking two more bridges. So that's how we have 4B plus 2B, total of six bridges. So in the so in the we require that all the events should have at least six bridges. And then, just like before, we make all possible combinations of three BJ pairs. And the combination for which the BJ pairs have the invariant mass between 45 GB window around the pseudoscalar, and also the pairwise satisfying the asymmetric curve is selected. So we have select, we have uh, found the BJ pair which satisfy the invariant mass of the pseudoscalar. And they also satisfy the asymmetric one. Now we have to identify which of the BJ pair is coming from the prom pseudoscalar. So as, as I said before, the prom pseudoscalar should have higher transverse momentum compared to the non prom pseudoscalar. So in the combination, in the, we select, we, choose, uh, we make this criteria, we check this condition. So if BI and BJ is coming from the prom pseudoscalar, then this, uh, this condition, these two conditions will be satisfied. So once we find out BI and BJ, which are coming from the from pseudoscalar, the remaining two pairs like BKBL and BMBN are coming from the non prom pseudoscalar. So these four Bs make a system, uh, make a four B jet system whose invariant mass will give the mass of the heavy heat. Now, if just like before, if some uncorrelated BJs are also satisfying this condition, for example, BJ and BK are also satisfying this invariant mass condition, then we have to we have to check whether the reconstructed heavy Higgs and this prompt pseudoscalar are maximally separated in the eta phi space or not. So we have to choose the correct combination in that way. I mean, the deconstructed heavy Higgs and the prompt pseudoscalar for the correct combination should be, should give the maximum angular separation. Okay, why do you say partial fleet? I don't know. Just, just go to next page, please. I mean, all. In, in this screen, I cannot see it. So, so uh, I'm going to try again. Okay. <laughs> no. okay. So what is the branching ratio of A to BB? A in this case in your for almost 80%, 80 percent for benchmark point one. Uh-huh. And rest 10 percent to the gluon mode and Without our mode. That's why you only use the PV. Yeah, PV. Okay, so, so this is the histogram for the signal. The blue one is the for the uh, for the signal when we tag at least six BJs. So this blue histogram contains all the electric processes, but since the reconstruction is based on the AAA mode, the contribution over here comes dominantly from the triple A. So this blue histogram is obtained when we select with events at least six BJs. But there's a problem. I mean, 
when we select events with six digits, we cannot estimate anything about the background because for the QCD multi-jet, for having six BJs, tagging six BJs is extremely difficult. So we cannot give any estimate for the background when we select events with at least six BJs. So once again, we have to relax our algorithm. So what we do, along with the six BJs, we also select events which, which have five BJs. So the idea is that it might happen in some events that one of the BJs are not tagged in the detector. So they are mistagged as live jet. So we also select events where we have five BJs. We are of course taking events with, which are greater than six BJs, but we also include events where we have five BJs. So one of the non bjs or the light jets has to be the, the BJ, which is actually mistagged as light jet. So we run the, for the case of when we have five bjs, we run the algorithm with one with the with the non bjet, giving the I mean with the leading non bjet and check this criteria. This this criteria. If this criteria is satisfied with the leading non bjet, then we assume that that is that one is our missed missed uh, mistagged. Uh, that was a, uh, that was actually the widget which is actually mistagged as a jet. But the, if the leading non widget doesn't satisfy this criteria, then we go to the sub leading non widget to check whether this criteria is satisfied or not. So if that if that jet satisfies this criteria, then we will consider that sub leading non widget as actually the widget which is mistagged. So we we uh, do this way unless we find the correct non widget which satisfies this criteria. So, so this is that's why I have written over here. We have hurdles of we have some hurdles for the case of heavy heat reconstruction. So we also select events with five widgets, and the sixth widget is assumed to be one of the light jets. So, so if you, you, you are you assuming. A1, A2, A3 can have, I mean, A1, A2, A3 have all have the same mass? Do you assume? Yes, yes, yes. Do you I also have... assume, do you know the A mass of Fury or? A mass? The MA. Do you know MA? Uh, so it's strategy. You already know MA? Yeah, yeah. It's from other. Things. From other. Okay. Yeah. A, I have already reconstructed before. First, I reconstruct the daughter hit. And then, since we have reconstructed the daughter hit with good significance, now using the, the mass information of the daughter hit, I can trace the, I mean, reconstruct the masses of the parent hit. Okay, so, so we can see over here the blue distribution is when we have six digits, but we, have, we do not have corresponding backgrounds over here with six widgets, and the red, red histogram is for the signal where we have six widgets as well as five widgets. But since we have relaxed our algorithm, so the, the resolution is not so good in this case. The red one is obtained when we have six widgets as well as events with five widgets. And in the case of events with five widgets, we have to consider one of the non widgets as the BJ. So this we are doing just to get some estimate for the background. We are doing this kind of relaxation just to get some some statistics for the background. If we strictly focus, the background is the same. I mean, uh, for the signal, you consider the six BJ blue one and five BJ red one. That one. But for the background, you include. The Six. Six as well as five widgets. If we have done with only six widgets, if we require that the event should have at least six widgets, then, then we cannot get any estimate for the background because tagging six widgets out in the multi jet background is impossible. So that background includes only five widgets. At least five widgets. At least. Five. It can have six widgets also. But that number of events are very less. Um, in most cases, we have five bidets or like four bidets in the background. 
five bgs, four bgs. Okay, like this. So this kind of relaxation I'm doing just to get some estimate for the background. Otherwise, the best thing is to do with the six bgs. And we can see the signal is, the resolution is very good for when we have at least six bgs. So anyway, this is the background and this includes uh, at least five bgs event and the background includes the QCD background and the TT budget background. And these are distributions or normalized distributions. So, so the, uh, another problem which can arise for the heavy reconstruction is when the heavy Higgs to the zero scalar decay gets suppressed. I mean, in that case, the AW topology, this cross section will go down. And since the heavy Higgs reconstruction is based on the AAA topology, if the cross section itself is low, then the reconstruction, I mean, the significance of the reconstruction will be very, very low. So these are the two major hurdles for heavy heat reconstruction. So, so now let's give the, the significance of our, I mean, for, for our heat reconstruction. First, let's talk about the pseudoscalar. In this case, let me go back to the previous slide. Okay, so in this case, I took the I took the mean of these two distributions for the signal, and similarly the mean of the distributions for the background, and then identified the number of events within three bins, and then I made the cross sections of that. So this is the cross section for the signal, and this is the cross section for the background, and the estimated significance is eight sigma for the pseudoscalar reconstruction for benchmark point one. And for benchmark point two, the significance is five sigma. Uh, the, for benchmark two, the significance is reducing because the BJs are all softer over here. Now for the charge reconstruction and for the heavy reconstruction, once again, I find the number of events within these three bins for the signal and for the background and estimate the cross section and then find the significance. So for the heavy, for the heavy reconstruction for benchmark point one, the significance is higher compared to the charge Higgs because this is because for the heavy Higgs reconstruction we need at least five bs, but for the charge Higgs reconstruction we need at least four bs. So the number of I mean the requirement of large, large number of bs are reducing the background. That's why the heavy heat reconstruction will give you better significance. But that's it. I think here comes the Hamas question. Mm. If you look at the, uh, so is this cross section? Yes. One? I mean, I mean the number of events within these three bins divided so, by the luminosity. Divided by the luminosity. Uh, so can I call it, it's a uh, scaled uh, number of events. Scaled number of events yeah. or uh, cross-section. Cross-section cross section within three bins. Yeah, yeah. So in Tentobar, right? Yes. This is all in Tentobar. So if you look oh, at I should the, have written somewhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the background cross-section, it's huge. Eh? So if you include the background, so I'm sorry, if yeah, one person yeah. or five, usually because this is QCD background. QCD background. So has at least you should include ten percent. Ten percent will ten percent will just wash away your signal. Yeah. So but our approach is very conservative. All of us, we didn't put any selection cut. Our approach is very conservative. In fact, as I told before, I mean, ah, uh, there it is. Here we have used the combination, I mean, the pairing is done just based on the, that the, they should satisfy the invariant mass of the zero scale. But actually, in principle, we should also use this, this, the closeness criteria, the delta R criteria. But if we apply these two things together, then for the background, we will run out of statistics. So our approach is very nice and very conservative. I mean, if we make the cut stronger or we, if, even if we make it 0 0.1, they will all decrease the background significantly, but the signal will remain quite strong. 
So of course, if we over here, if we include some statistical uncertainty for the background, then we will lose the significance. But on the other way, if we make the selection criteria or if we make the algorithms more stronger, then we will get better significance. Yes, very, very conservative approach because the problem is that we do not have enough statistics for the multi gate background. Even 100 million background is very less. We should have like 500 million or maybe like 1000 million events like this. It's a very crude approach. Yeah, I see. I see. So that's after imposing the big thing, right? Mm -hmm. Background cross section mm -hmm. is about 11 picobar. So you mean in the phase space, you mm -hmm. declare, yeah. right? Yeah, in this phase space. Yeah, yeah, yeah this phase. All within the three bin phase space. That's very charitable. Yeah, it's very charitable. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the, the moral of the story is that if we have inclusive for the final state mediated dominantly by the electrobic process, then uh, also when the pseudoscalar is light, which goes to the BB bar mode and gives the inclusive final state, we have the we have the the top, we can make the topologies, we can divide the topologies of the electrobic processes and reconstruct all the BSM history. This is not possible if the 4B inclusive state was dominantly mediated by, by the gluon fusion. For, for, for example, if the QCD process is the dominant one, then it will give to a A. And this can give to two B B B B B B B. So we can also have four B inclusive state via QCD process, but in that way we can reconstruct only the pseudoscalar and the heavy Higgs. But we have no scope to reconstruct Charlie. It can only be done if we have electrobic contribution coming through the charge processes. Okay, so. At the same time, I also studied the 4B plus W, that W goes to the leptonic channel. So this is the charged final state. So this cannot be achieved through the QCD process. So the dominant contribution is one thing in the AW, where the charge, where the zero scalar is produced with charges and just like before it decays to AW and can give 4B and the W when it goes to the leptonic mode, it gives Lepton and missing transition And the subdominant contribution will be like the triple AW, AZW, AWW. So they all contribute to give the final state 4B plus lepton plus missing energy. And this final state can only be achieved through electrobic process. There is no QCD counterpart for it. Since we have one lepton over here, we can now evade the multi gel background. We don't have any multi gate background over here. So the dominant background will be the TT barges. And if we consider the only the lepton, semi leptonic and fully electronic mode of the TT bar background, we have the cross section of 458 picobar. Now, traditionally, chi square is used to for mass reconstruction, but the, as I mentioned before, the inclusive 4D state is much better option. For, for the mass reconstruction of pseudoscalar, heavy heat, and charges. So I, I would not use chi-square over here for the reconstruction of charges and, and the pseudoscalar because the 4B mode is much better option because it gives, it, it helps to reconstruct all the mode. So rather I use chi-square to discriminate this signal from the background. The idea is that the, the digit from here should be close to the pseudoscalar mass, and this B8 pair, this BJ pair, and the lepton and the neutrino should have the invariant mass close to the charge. But our problem is that if we want to find the 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 
the full momentum of the neutrino, I mean to get the invariant mass of this four system, the BJ and the lepton and neutrino, we need to know the full momentum of the neutrino also, which is quite difficult because the Z component of the four of the full momentum of the neutrino cannot be estimated. But anyway, so uh, so this chi square I have made based on the signal topology. So I test six signal hypotheses. These are the six, six signal hypotheses. And to find the chi square, once again I have to make two BZ pairs. And I use the once again the delta criteria with an offset of 0 0.8 to make the two BZ pairs. Okay, so one question. Yes, uh, excuse me, I just have a question about the charge it takes masses. So I see in the previous slide, they have the charge it takes masses around 100 GeV and also 10 beta is around 15 and 10 beta 6. So uh, are you sure you satisfy the tau to, uh, tau, uh, the beta tau nu and the beta s gamma? Because I know I know it's actually like uh, uh, b uh, tau nu set a constraint on the 10 beta mh a plane where MH is boosted to be 500 GeV to the current measurement. So I'm, I'm wondering how, how you satisfy this? Was this a small value for the charge it takes, a small mass? Uh, this, uh, the flavor physics constraint will be, uh, will be limited only to low tangent beta. For this uh, tangent beta's are quite high. So this is the again in the phimophobic range. Mm -hmm. So six, 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 ten beta six, and one hundred fifty for the MHA plus is still allowed. Uh, which benchmark point are you talking about? Four. Like for example, one four. Four. Uh, this one. Uh, yes. Uh, as far from uh, as far as from B to S gamma constraint, they are satisfied. But yeah, mm -hmm. they in type one two SGM, the they should not put any limit. Oh, sorry, so you say again. Uh, in type one two SGM, they. I mean, what are your what is your question? Can you just okay? So, it? okay, so the question is that the uh, there are two processes actually that constrain the mass or mm -hmm. this, the main constraint for the mass of the charge it takes in 10 beta plane from the B physics, like B2 S gamma and mm -hmm. the B2 tau nu. And especially B2 tau nu, they put severe constraint on uh, if you, in, in this kind of ranges for the 10 beta, and it actually pushes the mass for the charge it takes to be larger than 500 GeV. So I'm wondering, wow. because if you, if, you, if you just basically, if you uh, decrease the mass of the charge it takes, you can simply, uh, increase the branching ratio for these processes, and then you violate the measurements. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm wondering how, how did you get uh, this low mass is still allowed with these kind of uh, the values for the 10 beta? So I, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering. Uh, you are so saying the, that uh, this low masses, this low masses will be ruled out? Yes, I think so, yes. So have you checked this carefully because? I have checked with the B2S gamma constraint. B2S gamma? Yeah, B2S gamma, they are consistent, they are allowed. Okay, so B2 tau nu actually, it also sets a severe constraint to the mass of the charged Higgs. But in Taiwan, B2 but, tau nu constraint is weaker than yeah. the B2. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is Taiwan, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. this is type one, not okay. type X. Okay, okay. And also yeah. type two. I think type two also sets it. Type a two and type, Especially in type, type X, telling you is mm. very important. But okay. this is type one, so it's okay. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Thank you for this clarification. Thank you, thank you. I mean, throughout my talk, I mean, I am restricted only to, only to type one. So. Okay, okay. Sorry if I missed that. Sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you. So for me, for we type one to LGM. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the chi square is based on the signal topology, and we also use the signal hypothesis. The signal hypothesis is used over here, <laughs> and in the chi square, we also have the mass resolution. 
sitting in the denominator. So these mass resolutions are nothing but the expected uncertainty in the measurement of the masses of the pseudoscalar and charge heat. So let me discuss in more detail about the chi-square. So once again, we out of the four V, we make two BZ pairs by using the delta R criteria with an offset of 0 0.8. Now also we need to find the Z component of the neutrino momentum. So now if we assume that the missing transverse energy corresponds only to the one neutrino coming from the W decay, then we can estimate the Z component of the neutrino by using this invariant mass criteria. So this is a quadratic equation. So if we solve, I mean, if we expand right in terms of X, Y, Z components and try to solve the quadratic equation, we will get two solutions for the Z component of the neutrino. So of, of course we do not get absolute value for the, for the V component of the neutrino. And also if the discriminant is negative, I mean, when we have uh, imaginary rooks, then we have to only take the real part of the solution. So anyway, so that's how we find the V component of the neutrino, provided that the, the new, there's only one neutrino coming from the W decay. And now we have to estimate the, the mass resolution, which is, as I mentioned before, the expected uncertainty in the measurement of the masses of A and charge A. So for that, we do the Oh, the figure is missing. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, there should be a figure in there. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> my God. Sorry, I'm going to. Sorry about that. I think my PDF file has a problem. Uh, can you connect to my system? Uh, sorry? Can you connect to my laptop? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it possible? Then... Is it type? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry for that. Is he connected to Zoom? Uh, I think it's not connected to Zoom. Yeah, it is, it is not connected to Zoom. I, need, I think you need to connect your laptop to the Zoom. Please go to your main. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, you can go to your mail. And there's mm -hmm. a, yeah, there there is a uh, link. Okay, okay. Yeah. Please go. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There, there. Here, please. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Oh, no, no, no. Mute. You should mute because there, there is another mic. Okay. And uh, please share our screen.
Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, anyway, so I obtained the decomponent of the four moment of the neutrino, and now we have to estimate the mass resolution for the pseudo scalar and for the charging. So for that, we need to do the truth reconstruction. So for the truth reconstruction, I consider, I mean, we have two BJ pairs. The BJ pair which has got the leading BJ should reconstruct the mass of the, for the mass of the prompt zero scalar. So this is how I do the reconstruction for the for the uh, pseudo scalar. And for this I have shown for benchmark point one, which corresponds to 50 GB, and for benchmark three, which corresponds to a mass of 70 GB. So the truth reconstruction for the pseudo scalar is done. And the width of these two distribution will give the, the mass resolutions for the pseudo scalar. For the charges also, I need to do the truth reconstruction for the BJ pair, which does not contain the leading BJ and the lepton and the neutrino. For the neutrino, I take the true information that is the I, that is I use the generator level neutrino for the truth reconstruction for charge heat and estimate the width over here to find the width of the width of the mass resolution for charge heat. So these are the mass resolutions for the six hypothesis or the six benchmark points for the zero scalar and for the charge heat. This uh, uh, these bits or the mass resolutions are used as an input to the chi square over here. Now, for each event, I, I, I make all possible combinations of chi square based on the two BJ pairs and the possible solutions of the neutrino Z component momentum and find and pick the one which has the minimum chi square as our chi square of the event. So since the chi square is based on the signal topology, so on uh, AAW signal topology, the chi square is expected to be very low for the signal, but for the background, the chi square is widely distributed. So we can use this chi square to estimate to uh, distinguish the signal from the background. So just to get some estimate of the, I mean, to get the discovery prospects of the 4B plus left on transmission energy state, we pair the 4BJ into two pairs and use this basic selection criteria. Now then use the chi-square cut, which is chi-square less than one. And the two BJ pairs should have the asymmetric cut of less than 0 0.1. And I provide another criteria that the eta separation between the BJ pairs should be less than 1.1. So these two uh, selection criteria are borrowed from the CMS paper. And then for for the six benchmark points, I get the significance like this. So these are the cross section, cross section uh, the pattern level cross section of 4B plus lepton plus neutrino. Uh, for all the all the electroweak modes, and I use the basic selection cut, and then the chi-square cut, and then the asymmetry and eta separation cuts to estimate the significance. So we can see that the chi-square is the is the most powerful discriminant, and it reduces the background by a significant amount without without much affecting the signal. So, so the chi-square is our, our best discriminator which distinguishes the signal or from the background, and we can estimate some significance over here, like greater than three signals. So let me conclude. So, is this slide? So for benchmark 1, the significance is 13.55 and benchmark 6, 2.92. Why is so much different? Uh, this is because, you see, the cross-section is reducing over here. Benchmark 6 is not a good, I mean, the cross-section the uh, the cross -section is falling with the masses of the of the charges and that's why. Here the charges is much heavier. Charges and heavy is are much heavier. So all the, the electric cross sections are low compared to benchmark point one. So the benchmark point one is like the, the best signal hypothesis and benchmark point six is like one of the bad 
things don't happen. So. But using chi square, we can still get a good significance. Could you go back to the description of your benchmark? Because as far as you remember, your chart to expose to mass is not that so oh, uh, it's uh, over there, here. there. Because you consider the so <laughs> normal scenario. So mm -hmm. your BH or your charge to exposure can be much heavier than that, right? Yes. Yeah. And so that's why that's my concern because you showed only a few benchmark yeah, points. Yeah, it's close yeah. to the um, yeah. electric scale. Masses are when when the masses are close to the electric scale. When it's very far from the yeah, when it's very large, then you cannot get any significance. Yeah. I see. Okay. So anyways, so let me now conclude. So so we know that I mean to probe the full, I mean to understand the electric symmetry breaking via Higgs mechanism, we need to probe the all the Higgs Higgs bosons in the in the in the framework, in the basic <laughs> framework. So the electric process provides the charge two BFS and the three BFS which are not possible in the QCD process. And the neutral 2BFS and 3BFS have both electrobic and QCD contribution. But since we are, um, we are focusing the Fermi for these scenarios, this, um, this neutral 2BFS or the 3BFS can overcome the QCD processes. So in that sense, uh, in, in the scenarios with Fermi for BFS, just like in type 1 PSGM, the electrobic processes are more important than the QCD processes. So I studied the inclusive 4B final state, which is mediated dominantly by the electrolytic process in the case of homophobic, homophobic Higgs set with light pseudoscalar. And uh, the good thing is that we can reconstruct all the all the BS and Higgs set, which would have been impossible if the inclusive 4B was mediated dominantly by, by a QCG process. Along with that, I studied the, the 4B plus lepton plus missing energy signal which is a characteristic only of the electric process because this is a charge final state and hence there is no QCD counterpart. So we need a very strong discriminator which will discriminate the signal and the background. So I designed the chi-square based on the signal topology and, uh, and estimated the significance for, the, for this state higher than three signals using this chi-square selection curve. Okay, so there is one, one problem which I would like to mention regarding this chi-square. It's that the chi-square, so when I apply the chi-square over here, in the chi-square formula, I use the, the signal hypothesis corresponds to this benchmark point one. So this chi-square over here is a chi-square one. The chi-square over here uses the signal hypothesis benchmark two. So this corresponds to chi-square two. And similarly, this is chi-square three, chi-square four, chi-square five, chi-square six. Now we find some excess with a good significance of like 13.55 sigma applying this chi-square, chi-square one. But when we uh, find the excess, it's very difficult to infer, I mean, from where the signal is coming from. I mean, suppose we have obtained this significance using chi-square one, but suppose if I use chi-square three over here, and if you get some three sigma or like four sigma, then what we will say, I mean, the chi and the signal, I mean, excess is coming from which signal? Chi squared that corresponds to BP3 or chi squared that corresponds to BP1. So that's, that's one problem in this world. So even though I, I use chi squared as a selection cut to, to find any excess over the, uh, over the background, and the chi squared depends on the signal hypothesis, but it's very hard to, once we get the excess, it's very hard to estimate from where the signal is coming from. So that's why I said at the beginning, chi-square is conventionally used for mass reconstruction, but for the charge final state, we have, we, we can reconstruct only charge sheets and pseudoscalar via chi-square. So I didn't use chi-square for mass reconstruction. For mass reconstruction, inclusive 4B, as I showed before, is much better option. So that's one problem over here. So anyway, I use chi-square just to estimate the significance of the 4B plus L plus neutron. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for listening.
Transport dice nice pop. Uh, any question? Any question in the Zoom? Already we have a lot of questions during this seminar. Uh, if <laughs> if there is no question, let's back to the speaker again. Sorry, sorry for the no, okay. no, proceeding. Yeah. Maybe I think <laughs> you, uh, when you come to here, maybe you took uh, almost one hour, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I have no word about anything from. <laughs> oh, can I? Can I disconnect to Zoom? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah of course.